Wow, ah, there's a lot of people and uh, it's kind of fresh after uh, so many months in a different setting, always with the Zoom and endless back to back. Um, and yeah, as uh, as already said, my name is Milos and I want to talk to you today about uh, geospatial analytics on the lake house. And this is a, um, a, an architectural pattern that ASA Databricks have pioneered. And it's uh, as an idea is to bring the best of the data warehouse capabilities and the data uh, lakes. So give you that data lake expansion and give you that structure that uh, data warehouses do. And uh, um, why we focus also on geospatial at Databricks, we, our core business is to uh, process large volumes of data. And um, if you think traditionally around uh, geospatial data, we see these uh, uh, smaller data set, and when I say smaller, smaller in our context, large in some other context, but uh, which were addresses, so you have points, uh, they are usually very simple feature, you just have lat and long, or in UK you have northings and eastings. Uh, but then when you start um, attaching the point data to um, uh, IoT type of use cases, or satellite data, or um, LiDAR even, you start to gain much more volume and much more complexity, and the question of scalability becomes so much more uh, pertinent and central to how you think about these things because it's not the same thing as uh, scaling processing on one million point as scaling processing on one million polygons that each one may have 500, 600, 3,000 points in its uh, boundary. So um, what you see on the screen here is uh, uh, what we think is a um, vision for the geospatial analytics in, in our ecosystem, uh, all spanning from Databricks as a compute uh, uh, provider. So um, we um, are, uh, uh, so, oh, I'm very bad with these things, laser, okay. So uh, we're focusing on building solutions with our customers and a lot of what you've seen today with uh, um, other presentations were solutions also built on top of Carto and where we uh, position ourselves in that wider architecture is in, in, a, in the back side of the, in the back room, the ones that crunch all of the numbers and they can serve the data and you can then import that pre-processed data in your data observatory and, and consume it. So think like data engineers that need to crunch a lot of data. And uh, uh, we, as I said, we, we partner with, uh, with Carto and we, we plan to expand on that ecosystem. And we are also bringing in a lot of uh, investment in building native support inside of Databricks as uh, it comes to geospatial data. So think of your spatial SQL also where you can do your machine learning and, uh, and other advanced use cases. Finally, we, uh, we have uh, released this year a solution called Delta Sharing that uh, um, unifies the protocol for exchange of large volumes of data across cloud uh, in a simple and declarative uh, uh, form. So uh, what you can do in that case, be completely cloud agnostic, um, um, abstract from where your data is stored, use the same mechanism and uh, share data across parts of your business or within your uh, digital supply chain. Um, and again, consume it uh, at, at the end uh, in a solution like Carto and, and, and use it and combine it as uh, different layers of your data. And finally, uh, most of the things we do uh, in this space, we, we uh, put there for the, um, our consumers to use. So we have this concept of solution uh, uh, accelerators, purpose-built end-to-end uh, um, uh, pieces of software and analysis, and they are uh, all available on, on our uh, um, webpage. So uh, I mentioned a little bit about the lake house, but what it is, so as I said, it's an architectural principle that brings the flexibility of the uh, data lakes and uh, combines it with the um, properties of data warehouses. So you keep uh, the structure, uh, you can trust your data, which was a a uh, relatively tricky thing to do in, in the lake house due to flexibility. Oftentimes we started having a deterioration in quality. Um, and uh, we uh, provide that through uh, the, the Delta, Delta Lake and the Delta as a, a file format. And um, what that brings uh, uh, as a capability and unlocks is ability to uh, ingest both streaming and batch data and uh, abstract from the complexities of structure both structure, unstructured, and semi-structured data can all feed into the same place um, using the same APIs and same type of coding. So you don't really need to think differently if you're having streams or differently when you um, uh, have batches. And um, 
it's a, a cloud agnostic because we are provided on all three uh, major clouds. And finally, that uh, brings a lot of capabilities uh, like a data lineage, like ability to share the data and uh, ability to feed efficiently your machine learning and AI. Um, and why, why are we here today? We see a massive value in uh, uh, thinking as um, um, a partnership with Carto and uh, as I said, we are a compute engine. We, we are focusing on a general compute that can process large volumes of data, both geospatial and other. And th through that compute, you can then produce new data sources that, that can be exposed in your data observatory and in, then in effect feed into your uh, uh, geospatial analytics use cases in an ad hoc manner and building all of those great things we've seen uh, throughout the day. Um, Finally, uh, just to solidify a little bit on those efforts and the focus that we are actually uh, working towards uh, um, uh, geospatial as a first class citizen in our platform, we have uh, at the beginning of the month released uh, a Databricks Labs project uh, called Mosaic. So if you're interested in that, just search, just Google Databricks Mosaic and that will be um, uh, one of the first um, results. It's, um, what you see here is an expansion on that previous architecture around cloud. And if you think in the traditional uh, um, warehousing uh, medallion layer architecture, you usually have that bronze, silver, gold type of nomenclature. What we think around geospatial is that we maybe need to pause around the bronze for a second. And there is an inherent interoperability question. I mean, Javier was talking about geoparquet and uh, standardization there. So, um, at the moment, we focus on WKB and WKT GeoJSON. We want to support GeoParquet as well uh, um, uh, very soon. But ingest the data, keep it in the cloud in a non-altered way in case something happens down the pipeline, you can restore from the, 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 the beginning. Then index, always index geospatial data. Without indices, things will just not scale. It, it's, um, Parallelization comes from uh, a unification principle. All rows or all observations should be similar to one another, then they can flow at a similar speed. If they are inherently different, you need to trick the machine into believing they're same. And I think that's where we are uh, trying to use indices as um, um, a way in tricking the, the processing engines to uh, think of that as equality relationships, and then they can perform all of the relational algebra, all the types of join then become more scalable. Now that you have the data index then and uh, represented in a in a same way, they are then just layers of your of your um, maps and of your uh, analysis, and you can then perform all of the transformation that you want uh, in preparation for the data to be exposed for other analysis. And uh, finally, we have this um, new layer that is very important and probably much more important in the geospatial domain than in other domains around visualization because the problem inherently is around describing the world and then overlaying the, the insight in that world. It's not just something that you want as a table. So visualization engines and, and, and um, that visual interactivity is, is such a dominant topic. So expanding on that medallion layer into additional two layers with uh, addressing two specific needs of the, of the domain. And um, that's, that's for me. I didn't want to uh, necessarily overwhelm you with the framework on its own. It was more about sharing the vision and, and the trajectory. And I don't know if we have time for questions. And then I'm all, all yours. Please shoot. Well, I'm just going to make it here with this. I know the answer, but I think it's very relevant to this audience. Uh, I know, that, uh, Milos, you've been working with VNGs and some of the uh, British national yes. indexes. So I would love to, to hear a little bit about uh, what, how do you think, how can Databricks support that, and what's your vision on that? So, yeah, we, yeah. Um, it, yes, yes. So, um, uh, what we uh, what we've seen today, and actually it's it's a it's a native uh, uh, item inside of Carto, is the H3 index as a hierarchical indexing system. So it lets you 
zoom in uh, in and out and represent your data in different uh, level of granularity and gives you all of those benefits. Now, um, um, UK uh, has uh, this, uh, um, for the ones that are not from here, has this uh, government entity called Order and Survey. They are the primary cartographer uh, organization of the, uh, of the United Kingdom and they have uh, their own system of indexing called British National Grid. It, it is uh, likewise a grid indexing system, it's just based on squares. And the only uh, tricky business is that it only works in a local uh, context because it's a, it's a planar projection, so it's not a, it's not a global system. But everything we've seen pretty much throughout the day as far as representing geometries, optimizing joins, and uh, unifying the, those operations is transferable between the uh, grid in index systems. Same would apply to S2, which is the, the Google standard, or to the, the quad trees uh, that's another way of representing. So we're, we're working uh, um, actively with Ordinance Survey as, as our uh, partner for brainstorming around these topics and a lot of what we did uh, implement in, in Mosaic as a framework was originally discussed with them and uh, in the coming versions of the, the library we will have a dual support for both H3 and, and, and BNG. So forever, whoever is only thinking in Eastings and Nordings, stay tuned, that's gonna be very, very interesting soon. Um, I just had a question on data processing. I wanted to ask, um, you know, Postgres GIS has so many different functions and the ecosystem is very mature. If I wanted to replicate that in a parallelized way, um, what did you use? I know Apache Sedona is doing really well. Um, what other tools do you guys see people using? So, uh, I. In my mind, the answer would be a uh, combination of uh, Sedona. Sedona has a pretty good uh, support for a lot of geospatial operations. Um, one minor challenge, and I really say minor because it can be easily worked around, is the, the fact that they use the spa spatial RDDs and they're not necessarily easily importable. Again, I think that connects to one of the slides Javier shown where components break the communication channel and it makes it a little bit channel challenging. Hopefully when the uh, Geoparquet uh, um, hits the ground running, some of these things are gonna be abstracted a bit. Uh, where I think they'll, the, the framework lacks a little bit is that um, um, index first approach. So why I would advise is you can use something like Mosaic index first, uh, get that uh, H3 representation of everything. Then you can feed the geometries into Sedona for um, that broader uh, ST uh, SQL dialect. And uh, finally, when you're, you know, pre-processed your data to uh, a good standard and you are assured of your quality, you can then uh, expose it to uh, engine like Cartoot for combining with other data sources. That would be a short answer. Uh, three things. Thank you.